so I have I have my baby here. Um, this is a traditional uh, style uh, kamali uh, made for me in the uh, style of Kev Soretti uh, by Gocha Lagidze, who's a Georgian swordsmith who lives and works in the Netherlands. Um, this is, I love this sword. Um, this is an early style blade, um, what would have been considered a type one. Um, and you can see here on this one, this is a straight blade, right? Um, the, it comes to an acute point, but the false edge here is not sharpened. Um, only the front edge is sharp. It has a single broad fuller, and this is an early example of a Kamali. Um, the handles on these are, they're hilted like similarly to a shamshir, but they're embellished with all these studs and plates and sometimes wire wraps, right? And this does a couple things. It makes it a tougher handle, but it's also grip. Um, the end effect of these plates and that decoration is that the sword sticks in your hand. Um, in later periods, this sword tended to get slightly curved and have much more complex fullering. Um, but when I had this made, I specifically wanted an early style um, for what we do. What kind of steel is that? So this one is a modern steel. Um, but the best swords in period would have been made by, um, well, Georgians got their swords two ways. Imported blades from Western Europe were uh, very common, in particular from Northern Italy and parts of Germany. Um, and of local swords, um, blades imported from Persia or Dagestan were popular. Swords made in Georgia, the very best, the Gerda swords, uh, the well-marked ones, might have been made with Georgian bulat, their crucible steel. Um, which is a really fascinating process of, of small batch steel making um, from iron ores. And some of the recipes are literally like, go get a pinch of dust from this road in this village, because it happens to have the trace elements they needed to add. Um, and traditional tests on these um, involve bending the blades 90 degrees safely, and also putting an iron nail on the anvil and chopping the nail. So, you know, the kind of stuff you see on Forged in Fire, right? Almost abusive tests was what the Georgian Smiths would use to determine if a sword was good, worthy enough to, to bear the quality marks. Do you have another style of, uh, of sword, Georgian sword you can show us? Um, I have a second Georgian sword with me in the same style. Um, this is a much less fancy. Um, this is uh, a cheaper make. Um, but other styles of swords that are used in Georgia, and I don't have with me. Um, so, I mean, the shashka, right? The, the very famous, simple, lightly curved saber with no hand guard and the hooked, you know, spread pommel, um, appears to have originated in the Caucasus region. Um, it was heavily used in Georgia. Uh, and from them, it spread into the, the Russian and, and Cossacks um, until that was officially adopted. Um, and there are regional variations. You can tell the difference between a, you know, a Kevser, well, the Kevser tended to stay with the Kamali, but you could tell the difference between say a Svan Shashka and a Dagestani Shashka by the scabbarding, by the hilting, by the, you know. Um, and then the last style would be um, that I would say is what you'd call a Satavari um, or later the Kanjali. Um, the Satavari is really, you know, the big, it, some people will translate the name as like dagger brother. Um, and it looks like a Kinjal dagger, just scaled up. Um, there's also the Dashna, which is single edged, often made from a broken Kamali blade or a Shashka blade. Um, and it will have 
you, typically a Kinjal style uh, hilt, but a, you know, a single edge blade. And there are parallels, you know, as I'm sure you're aware in, in Persia to most all of those. Um, Okay, very interesting. Let's move on to heavier weapons. Do, did they use axes and maces as well? So in Kev Soretti, not so much the mace. Um, in Lowland, Georgia, we do see maces. Um, it, axes, however, in the mountains, yes. Um, and we do have snippets um, of that there may have been both you know, like large woodsman's axe fighting styles yeah. and also shorter axes and used in pairs um, or used with a buckler, just like you would a sword. Um, we've done a little experimenting with that and it actually works very well, um, but there's nothing that I can say, here we have a source for this, go do this authentically Georgian thing. You know, just bits and rumor really. Um, spear was very common in the region as well. Um, and uh, not in Kev Sereti, but in uh, the English, uh, in Ingushetia, uh, near there, um, they very often left forks. They, they'd make the haft of the spear out of a tree branch and leave one or more forks on it. And it, for the longest time, I wondered why but it serves two purposes. One, in later periods, it becomes a rifle rest. You stab the head of your spear into the ground and you can steady your, your flintlock for hunting um, or fighting. And two, if you need to set up camp, it's a ready-made cross piece. All you need is a rope and you can tie off and hang a cloth and make a tent. So it was incredibly practical usage. I have another question. Did did what kind of shape did the spear had have? They vary. Um, you know, we see a very classic, you know, uh, you know the the classic sort of Mediterranean style or Aegean style spear, right? You know, out and back that you know elongated diamond shape. Um, but we also see some real odd ones. Um, Elishvili shows one spear that's almost a trident. It has like a round spike in the middle and then two pieces that have been forged and split off that come up and hook forward, also spiked. So like a mini trident. A step, I would assume that was for hunting or fishing primarily and also used as a weapon. Um, less diversity in the spearheads that have survived where we have incredible diversity in survived is arrowheads. We see all sorts of special purpose arrowheads in Georgia um, for different things, different hunting, different military purposes. Um, and I, I have a, a friend in Georgia who's studied this heavily. He makes and sells traditional bows and arrows. Um, and it's really fascinating. What kind of bow did they use? Um, you know, about what you would expect for the region. Uh, you know, it's it's a a recurve style bow. Um, you know, sometimes composite, sometimes made. You know, depending on what you had. Um, but pretty universally, it's what we would what we see all throughout. You know, um, did they use the, the thundro, Middle East and Eastern Europe? Did they Europe. use thundro? Yeah. So um, as far as we know, um, they used both thumb and two or three three finger draw. Um, thumb draw was dominant in the early period. Uh, later period when it turned to less uh, serious weapon and was supplanted by uh, firearms, we start to see the three finger draw. Um, but interestingly, the Kevser have a holdout weapon, um, which are these spiked thumb rings that are believed to have descended from an archer's thumb ring. Um, there's a flat part in here and spikes or ridges on the outside. Um, and they're used, they're a holdout. Um, and the stories from Kev Soretti and then the, the tales 
say that this started from archers wearing thumb rings who then started adding other things to the thumb rings. So instead of having one, they would have a thumb ring and like two or three other supplementary rings because that way, if they were, you know, if somebody were to break through the lines while you were shooting and you didn't have time to transition away from the bow to something else, you had a weapon. Basically, you turned your fist into a spiked mace. mace. Um, and you could use it while shooting. Or so the story goes. How real that is, I don't know. It's a neat story. <laughs> okay. And then another question I would like to ask you, did they use cavalry or they were mainly infantry? So they definitely used cavalry. Um, in the mountains, most fighting was done on foot. Um, but the Kevsir were avid horsemen um, to the point where there are traditions and rules around a horse race needing to be run when somebody passed away and who rides the deceased's horse to represent them. Um, and uh, they, they did often fight on horseback. We don't have a lot of sources for that. Um, we know that they were considered to be highly aggressive on horseback as well. And we know that, again, highly mobile. Um, if you look at, and I'm going to go to a different region of Georgia, uh, the region of Guria in the southwest of Georgia is in particular known for their riding. Um, the so-called Cossacks in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show in the you know late 19th, early 20th century were in fact Gurian Georgians doing all the stunt riding. Um, so that kind of stuff, bareback riding, stunt riding, doing these things in your mail, doing it were very common throughout Georgia. Um, unfortunately, any kind of sources that would really give us information on how they did it other than just starting to ride at a very early age and being insanely skilled at it, they're gone. Maybe, maybe someday I'll find something in Georgian, but I haven't yet. None of my friends in Georgia have. Uh, what about, I mean, short range weapons like knives and daggers, what did they use? So the most common short range weapons would have been, you know, coming from your Kamali, you come down, you know, to your intermediate range, right? Your Sadavari and your Dashna. And then within that, you move down to the Kanjali, the Kanjali right? Your, your classic dagger style, um, you know, double-edged, pointed, um, and then from there you move down to the Ursa, right? Or the, the like belt knife, um, which were straight or curved. Some of them were hooked like a claw. Um, and we do see fragments uh, preserved in other parts of Georgia of styles of fight that included uh, a Kanjali and Ursa in pairs, one in each hand, or paired Kanjali. Um, we see both of those forms survive fragmentary, um, but not in Kebsereti, um, in other parts of Georgia. Very good. What about empty handed uh, fighting styles? So here's where I have two very distinct answers. In lower, in lowland Georgia, everywhere in Georgia except Kebsereti, wrestling is huge, as was were striking forms. Right. Um, what we most people today in MMA circles know as uh, Credoli is sort of the federated Georgian folk wrestling. Right. Huge parts of it went into what formed Samba, right, in, in the Soviet era. Um, it's a jacket wrestling style. It's traditionally performed with musical accompaniment. Um, and in its more extreme forms, there's the sort of you know, you, you'd say in, in Georgia, they would say you have Credoli and like military Credoli. And military Credoli involves a lot more striking, friendly, you know, uh, friendly wrestling. Chidoba, right, is just throwing each other. Um, in Kev Soretti, however, they don't really grapple. They don't box, they don't grapple. Um, it's really fascinating because all of Georgia does this, but the Kevser didn't. And uh, 
I'll relate a story from a, a Georgian colleague of mine who, who now resides in New York. Um, they were up in the mountains doing one of their research trips um, and talking to these Kebser elders um, who remembered this stuff from their youth, trying to capture this stuff before it went away. And because he'd studied heavily um, the Georgian striking and grappling arts, he was trying to ask this Kebser elder, like, what do, what do you do? And he's like, you know, so he's like, you know, well, what do I do if I need to fight somebody who's trying to attack me and I don't have my sword? And the guy's like, well, you take your dagger out. And he's like, well, what if I don't have my dagger? And you can see the guy start to get irritated. And he goes, well, you have your, your fighting ring, use that. And he's like, well, well, what if I don't have my thumb ring? And you can see the guy getting really ticked off. And he looks at him and he looks around and he goes, there are rocks, pick one up and hit him with it. In Kev Soretti, they didn't seem to have this concept of unarmed fighting. There was always a weapon, always use the weapon. In Lowland, Georgia, grappling and boxing, absolutely, and, and very focused on it. Um, it has certainly survived better than the weapon arts in most of Georgia. Um, and in fact, Georgia produces many very well-regarded MMA fighters um, who come out doing Georgian traditional arts supplemented by other things. Do you see a cultural difference between uh, lowland and highland in Georgia? There definitely are, um, in particular, right, the, the Kepser and the, and the Svan people who live in, in, up in the mountains um, have, uh, are known in Georgia for being very, not hot-headed, but ready to throw down, like, quickly, um, and for maintaining the tradition of blood feud, um, even into the modern day in limited forms. Um, and there are elaborate procedures for determining when a blood feud has ended and this and that. Um, but there, there are absolutely um, cultural differences. They're fading now, right, as communications lines open and things are more. But, you know, parts of these mountains were, were so isolated for so long that that process of fading didn't really begin until Stalin kind of hauled everybody out of the mountains to where he could control them during the Soviet era. Interesting. Um, another thing uh, is, uh, do they have any uh, thing like chivalry rules or codes for warriors there? So there, there absolutely are. Um, there are, like, like I explained, we have this elaborate code of what is okay if we're doing Perikeva, what is okay if we're, you know, settling a dispute, what is okay in wartime. Um, there are, um, other interesting traditions, like if two men are fighting and a woman removes her head covering and places it between them, they must stop immediately. Um, Georgia has an incredibly strong sort of warrior tradition with etiquette and stuff associated with it, um, going all the way back to the 13th century, um, to the Georgian national epic at least, right? The, the Knight in the Panther Skin by Shota Rustavili. Um, they valued cleverness as well as skill at arms. Um, there's a, a fascinating story about Queen, T Queen. well, she was crowned King Tamar. Um, we would think of her as Queen Tamar, who's one of the most beloved rulers in Georgian history. Um, and the poet, Shota Rustavili, who wrote that, um, where she came out with an apple and a golden arrow and offered her court um, I'll give this golden arrow to whoever can pierce this apple with it in my hand. And nobody was willing to do this, right? And the poet, you know, Rustavili says, you know, I'll do it. And he walks up and takes the arrow from her, grasps her hand in the apple in the other, and pushes it through in her hand. And everybody's, well, you can't, you can't. And she goes, I never said you had to shoot it from a bow. I never said how you had to do it, and hands him the apple and the arrow. Um, you know, is it a folk tale? Did it really happen? I don't know, but it's you know emblematic. Um, interestingly, in the Knight in the Panther skin, 
it looks east. Their 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 court, right? It's it's very much a, a, an epic romance of its time, but they look to courts in India as their model, mm -hmm. um, not to Western Europe uh, or even Byzantium or Persia, where they have so much exposure. Okay, and uh, very interesting. And um, okay, Mike, just uh, at the end of our discussion, could you tell us why you, you said it briefly in the beginning, but I'm just really interested that you mentioned it. Why you as an American are interested in Georgian swordsmanship and martial arts? So really, you know, I got into it by accident. I was looking for something else and I found Elishvili's text. And I started looking at, there was, there was enough picture in it that I'm like, well, this is interesting. It's a sword and buckler system. And I, I've seen a lot of sword and buckler, but I've never seen anything like this. And so I started translating it very laboriously because my Russian is not great. Um, and neither was Elish Vilis, um, but I had some real experts to help me. Um, and I started poking at it and I started trying to make it make sense in my head. And the deeper I got into it, the more fascinating it became. And now I, here I am some 15 years later and I've learned far more about Georgian culture than I ever expected to. I've made some absolutely wonderful friends in Georgia. Georgia has this tradition of, of hospitality and generosity that is just amazing. Um, you know, I, I needed pictures of something that I could use. And a, a gentleman from Georgia literally went to the museum for me and photographed things. Um, Georgians are just some of the best people I've, I've ever interacted with. And the fact that this survived as long as it did and comes from this incredible legacy, um, I just feel like it's something really important uh, for the culture of the world as a whole. Um, you know, it's it's too beautiful, beautiful to be lost. So I try and learn, I try and share. I never feel like I know enough. Um, and you know, I'll keep learning forever. But if I can, you know, broaden this out and there are more people working at it and valuing it, um, then I feel like I've won something. Okay, very beautiful. Thank you very much, Mike. At the end, uh, just Thank could you. you just tell us uh, a bit more about yourself? I'm sure many viewers always ask, who was this? Could you tell us about your background, what you do, education, things like that? Yeah, sure. Um, all right, so I am 42 years old. I grew up in a small town in Michigan in the upper Midwest. I have been fascinated with fencing since I discovered my grandfather's foils. Uh, my grandparents lived with us um, on an old farm kind of in the middle of nowhere uh, when I grew up. Um, and I, I discovered his, his foils in the closet. He fenced under um, Bella de Tuscan in Detroit in the 1930s. And uh, I begged him to teach me. And he would not teach me blade work. He said he wasn't good enough, but he would teach me footwork. And I studied footwork constantly from the age of 11, because I wanted to do this. I wanted to sword fight so badly. Um, I wanted to do other martial arts as well. Um, we finally found uh, a martial arts school my father approved of when I was uh, 17, 16. And I started studying Taekwondo there. Um, had some wonderful time studying that. I went away to university. The Taekwondo club at the university was all sport. It was not traditional at all. Um, and so I, I left Taekwondo at that point. Um, and that was where I was doing some sport fencing for a brief while and then theatrical sword play um, because I had to do all the swords I could anyway. I also studied uh, Shorin Ryu uh, there under um, uh, a gentleman who convinced me how I never wanted to teach if I ever got good enough. Um, his highest praise was, eh, not bad, do it again. Um, and I swore after studying with him for several years that if I was ever teaching, I would be far more encouraging. I learned a lot from him, but it was emotionally a challenge for me. 
Um, and then in my theatrical group, a friend came in one day and goes, hey, Mike, you like history stuff. Check this out. And handed me a printout in, this would have been 1998 maybe, of Joseph Swetnam's Rapier Manuscript. And I looked at this and I went, this is actual historical sword fighting written by somebody in the period. How much do I owe you? You're not getting this back. Um, and from there I was lost. It's been historical fencing, you know, ever since. Um, any way I could get it, you know, studying on my own, you know, working from interpretations. Um, I studied uh, Fiore, Italian longsword, um, and grappling and other stuff um, with Maestro Hayes in Eugene uh, when I lived there. Um, was a wonderful several years before I had to leave for work reasons. Um, I was his senior student when I left. Um, and then I moved, when I moved up to Portland, um, I ended up founding the group Northwest Armatare um, because I needed practice partners. I wanted to keep training. Um, and sword play, you can only do so much training by yourself, right? There are times when you need another blade, you need partner drill, you need interaction, some sparring, less, I think, than most people want to do, but it does serve a purpose in our training. Um, and I've been running Northwest Armatsare for uh, seven years now, I think. Um, we started out as a group doing Fiore because that was what I had the most qualifications to instruct at. Um, and as my interpretation of Georgian has grown, um, that's become an integral part of our curriculum as well. Um, so my students and my group study both. Um, and actually, when we come back from Corona, um, I'm in the process of transitioning the Italian instruction uh, almost completely off of me to some of my senior folks that have trained with us for many years. Um, to allow me to focus on the Georgian, um, which has really become my absolute love. I've, I've sunk so much time and energy into it over the years um, that I just, I want to spend my time doing that research and bringing that out um, and writing. Um, you know, I did a translation. I'd really like to get that finished with new photographs and the additional material we've sourced from other places and put it together into uh, you know, a beginner's guidebook, you know, something that somebody can pick up and go. Um, I spend a lot of time conferring with colleagues in, in Georgia and in uh, actually the East Coast of the US. Probably the single most knowledgeable person on these arts alive today is Nico Abadzadze, uh, who resides in New York now. Um, but Nico is, does not correspond much. He's, he's kind of out of the scene. Um, his student, Vakteng Kizuria, um, however, writes a lot and corresponds well. Uh, in Georgia, Georgi Lasabitze um, has been an invaluable help, also made a sword for me at one point, that uh, a training sword that I, I like quite a bit. And one of these days, I'll, I'll manage to acquire one of his bows. Um, but, the challenge has been, you know, Nico and Vakteng tried to get a school going in New York City at one point in the early 2000s. Um, but I just, it's enough of a niche thing that there's not the density in one place to really make it sustainable um, by itself. We need to make this material accessible to people remotely, accessible over the internet. Um, working on trying to get some of these interviews, some of these, this footage, gather together into a central archive, um, you know, so that anybody who wants to learn this has a place to go and get it, to learn it, to find advice, um, you know, because today that doesn't, that hasn't existed. You know, it's taken me 15 years to build a network of, of advisors and colleagues that I can trust to give me an honest answer when I ask, can you say why this was done this way? You know, and if they many, don't know, they'll say it. <laughs> okay, many thanks. And you just, um, you're a software engineer. You studied computer science, correct? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I did. My, my education is all in computing. Um, yeah. I've, I've been doing that my whole life. I shipped my first code professionally at age 14. Um, and I've worked professionally since college on debug tools. I've worked mostly in the fabulous semiconductor space. Um, so I've done uh, a lot of embedded networking products. Um, in fact, a lot of stuff I've worked on is in core networking equipment and wireless routers around the world. Um, and these days I work for a machine learning acceleration company called Grok. Uh, we're a startup. We've got a unique architecture. We're doing some really cool stuff um, to make our computers more useful. Thank you very much. It was very informative, Mike, very fascinating. Thanks for being on Razmavsar TV channel. And uh, I wish you a nice day and hope to talk to you soon, Mike. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.